session uh, exemplifies actually successful women uh, who have assertive leadership as our previous panel did also. To host this panel, I invite my friend of many decades, I don't know what that means in giving out both of our ages, you know, <laughs> uh, Lakshmi Praturi, founder and CEO of Inc. And by the way, for many years, Lakshmi, come up. So for many years, um, Lakshmi, you know, has um, obviously curated this fantastic conference and I've attended um, every year uh, this conference. And in some ways, I think I've learned all my tips and tricks on doing these events, watching Lakshmi, you know, handle this uh, like the back of her hand and welcome Lakshmi. And nice. this year we have done this event in partnership with uh, Inc. and she'll talk more about the next session. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, I thought I should start this on a fun note, talking about leadership before I invite my two friends onto the stage. When I was in um, high school, not quite high school, about ninth, eighth, ninth grade or so, it is high school, we used to take a bus from our home to school and they would be like these idiots, you know, some cat calling idiots. I used to be very pissed, but I didn't know how to, you know, like talk back. So what I would do, I would take chocolate wrappers and wrap stones in them and catch all the girls, little girls, who, I mean, people younger than me who go to the same school with me, you'd sit on the top by the window and I would tell all of them, throw these stones on the guys when they get down. And when they look up, they'll just see some kids sitting there and they wouldn't know what happened. So this went on for a while till one day, uh, one of the girl's father saw this and told her, this can't happen again. And, but the guys, I think, started behaving a little better after that. So to say, I was the one who asked everybody to throw the stones, and Vani was one of the girls who actually threw the stones for me. <laughs> this is, so I've been corrupting her since primary school. So, <laughs> and now our friendship remained, and when she does something wonderful as this, I get to be part of it. So the big lesson out of it is count on your girlfriends and stay in touch. <laughs> So we are talking about leadership. I'd love to um, have on the stage two women who I consider most amazing leaders, um, Kritika and Varsha. Both of you, where's Varsha? Both of you, come on up. Um, I'll keep talking. Yeah, she's getting her mic. So I'll give you a little, pre you know, most of you know I do ink talks. It's about stories. It's about storytelling. So I'll start with, you can sit in the middle. Okay. <laughs> We'll start with stories. Um, so it's about leadership. There are three explorers who are very famous, Emerson, Scott, and Shackleton. So Emerson was very cunning um, one. He, he wanted to conquer South Pole, but he didn't want anyone to know. So he told everybody that he was going to North Pole, but actually went to South Pole. And so Scott, you can sit there. Scott who was going to South Pole actually, found out halfway through that Emerson was actually going to South Pole. And they had to hurry up and get there. And, you know, they didn't make it. By the time they went, Amundsen already had his flag. They were all dejected. And on the way back, pretty much everybody died. And Scott actually carried a lot of rocks, which might have actually slowed down his journey to study for science. And he kept writing in his journal. And the last entry, which was like a week before they were found, was that I just can't write anymore. But because of those journals, you know, there's a lot that's contributed to science. And finally, there was Shackleton, who took a group of people and went um, for a transantarctic explosion, exploration, not explosion, exploration. And uh, their, you know, ship broke. They couldn't even make it. So they had a 20-foot-long boat, and that's it. So only a few men could make it, and all the rest of them stayed back. And these guys made it back to England. For two years, he worked to raise money to rescue these men, and nobody would give him money, saying, you're out of your mind, nobody's going to be alive. But he raised the money, he took a boat, came back, and rescued all the men who were like living from ice to ice, so to speak, for those two years. So this is a, a quote that someone said that, uh, you know, if you have to memorize someone, Scott for scientific method, Emerson for speed and efficiency, when disaster strikes and all hopes are gone, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. So I think each of us have different 
leadership styles, we accomplish different things. And uh, may we find the Scots and Emmetsons and uh, Shackletons in each one of us. So with that, I will start my conversations with the two of them. Instead of giving a long introduction, you're going to learn about what they have done just through our Q&A. So, Kritika, my first question is to you. You know, you and I started our journey about the same time. We moved to India in 2010. And she has much more column space than I ever could. And uh, you and you came here representing a very established brand, you know, Facebook, and not very well known in India at that time. And they've really worked on increasing the awareness, usage, etc. But when you first came here, I'm sure the whole press wanted to talk to you, etc. What was your preparation like? What are the things you needed to do before you figure out what is Facebook's strategy here? Sure. Okay, before I answer that question, I'd love to just get a read of the audience here. Yeah. So uh, just a quick show of hands. How many women entrepreneurs do we have here? Oh my, how amazing. Can yeah. we give this room a huge round of applause? <laughs> Incredible. Uh, male entrepreneurs, I see that we do have amazing men here. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Mukesh raises his hand. Um, Mukesh, do you have a job? Oh, yeah, I guess you do. Okay, large <laughs> companies, people working, male, female, large companies. Okay, all right. Uh, good representation. Very good representation. Uh, and uh, incredible, right? I mean, 10% of all entrepreneurs are women. I think half of them are here. So, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, so, Lakshmi, to think about uh, the question that you asked me, right? How did I think about this when I started at Facebook? Honestly, when I started, I didn't spend very much time thinking about that question. Yeah, uh, and certainly, the f when I joined Facebook, you know, I was the first employee for Facebook in India. We had eight million people on connecting on Facebook then. Today, thanks to the fa fantastic work of our user growth team, we have over 140 million people. Uh, we had just Facebook, the app then, uh, the big blue app. Today, we also have WhatsApp, Instagram, Messenger. Oculus. Kept acquiring things yeah. through the years. Yeah, so so it's been quite a journey yeah. over the years. Uh, as I reflect on what's important in representing a big successful brand, you know, three things come to mind. Number one, knowing that every employee and every interaction, you know, it's one thing about the leader, but know that every employee and every interaction really speaks to the brand. Um, it's like walking into a Starbucks talking to the partner, you know, that's what they call the people who serve coffee uh, at Starbucks, it's their partners, um, where they greet you with a big smile and they say, yeah, they smile, they're already smiles, they say, welcome to Starbucks. Uh, and they're empowered to fix your drink if it isn't right, right? So every employee, every interaction really speaks to your brand. So for all of us, we have to obsess about how much we invest in the team in having them understand the brand and how much we are putting in place the values, the culture, the processes, such that it reflects our brand. So that's one. From a leadership point of view, it, again, when we started, you know, we weren't thinking too much about uh, the PR strategy per se. We were really thinking about how do we build the business. Um, and as a leader, I spent a lot of time just understanding what was Facebook's PR approach. Um, in our case, it's really about putting our partners and our clients at the center and letting them speak to what they're doing on the platform because it's what they do on the platform that really makes us what it is. Um, I even remember when I did a change of roles three years ago and started building out our marketing solutions organization. Again, the first year of that was all inward, you know, building the team, figuring out our strategy, which verticals we focus on, building Lighthouse, Lighthouse clients, where they were growing their business on our business. And it was then that we started talking about our stories. Uh, so that's, yeah. that was the journey and the progression. And yeah. it's been So very inward focus before you start speaking. And I totally agree with you. You know, Devjan and I were talking about Andy Grove a little earlier, uh, who just passed away recently. And his edict at Intel was that you do and then you talk. You never talk plans. You finish the project when the chip is ready to be delivered tomorrow. That's when you talk, not before that. And I, I had the fortune a, of yeah. actually studying with Andy Grove. Andy Grove teaches. Correct. He it's taught at the, management, yeah. at the course. And I remember I had my baby two weeks later. I was in class because I didn't want to miss Andy Grove's and, yeah, class. So yeah. 
So, Varsha, you have actually background in both large companies as well as a startup. You were at McKinsey, you know, Anjali was talking about it. And then after that, you started Eve.com with a co-founder in Idea Labs. So, I'm curious, as a representative of the company versus as a representative of your own startup, in what way uh, is your uh, public uh, persona or the way you represent the company differ in both those situations, or if they do? What I would say is if you are at the right company, uh, if you're in a larger organization, it's really not that different. Um, when I was the founder of Eve, uh, it was you know myself, my co-founder, was we were two women and a PowerPoint, and that's how we started. We went out, we raised funding. It was you know our mission and our vision right from the beginning, and and we were the target audience. We were selling cosmetics online. We were the first to, to be doing it. It was really back when people thought women were would not even buy on the internet. It was it was a while ago, <laughs> and fifteen and I think, years ago. Yeah, it was fifteen years ago. Um, and so we, it was very much at the center of us. We were the representative of users. We could uh, we could convey the passion. We knew the use cases, and so. And then we were able to bring people, as leaders, we were able to bring people around us, uh, attract them to our mission, wanting to be part of this journey of basically empowering other people to feel confident, get access to beauty products uh, wherever they lived and at a whole range of price points. And, and so I think what we were able to do well as founders and as leaders was create a vision that was attractive to other people and and bring people into that vision and allow them to kind of make that vision their own and to bring it to life. Um, I think now that I'm at Airbnb, what I really admire about our founders is that they have created a mission that is truly global around connecting people. And truthfully, uh, in this day and age, I will say that um, I would say it's even more important to have an incredibly strong and powerful mission because the millennial audience today is very mission-driven in terms of our workforce, even probably back when I, than when I started at Eve. And so I think the other thing that has um, great leaders today, I see, and our, our founders at Airbnb are a really great example of that, is even from the very earliest days, they created um, core values uh, around what they wanted the culture to be like. It was literally the three of them. They had no other employees, but they sat down and they wrote down what their core values, what they wanted them to be. And I always think, having been a founder myself, I think, wow, that's incredible foresight because, you know, I'll be honest, myself and my co-founder, we didn't, we never did that 15 years ago. And so, uh, but I think about how it's really helped us as a company as we've grown incredibly fast at Airbnb and we've gone global. Um, that consistency of talent that we can attract, uh, we all have implicit trust in each other because the core values are so strong. Uh, I think that is actually probably one of the first things that entrepreneurs should be thinking about from a leadership standpoint. So, Varsha, when you were interviewed, did they make sure you stayed at an Airbnb home uh, before they hired you? Not really? <laughs> no, I mean, the truth is, um, it's not about what they make you do. It's what yeah. you want to do if you are the right person for the company. You know, no one really in their right mind goes and interviews at Airbnb without trying the product, staying at the product, you really need to know what it's like to be a guest and ideally even what it's like to be a host because our product is our hosts around the world. And so, uh, again, if you're, if you're creating the right culture, you'll be attracting people who will, on their own, go out and have that initiative. Uh, and if, if they don't have that initiative, then it's, it's like an immediate check that probably there's not a fit. So, Kritika, let me ask you this. You know, as again, as a rep of Facebook in India, you deal with press a lot. Uh, you know, today we are talking about, you know, establishing your own leadership brand, creating it, etc. And while talking to them, you say one thing, they may write some other thing. You may say you did X, and they may say you did X, Y, Z. Have you had situations where what you said and what you came out wasn't quite the same? Uh, tell me your experience of uh, the truth and the... What do you think the answer the to that question is? <laughs> do you think the press always writes what's right? What do, what do we think? Shraddha does, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, so there are uh, 
two sides to this, right? So, uh, I, I mean, I think the audience knows the answer. Um, you know, as an individual, it's always important, you know, while I said every, every interaction represents, speaks to the brand, it's really important to delineate that you are a person representing a brand, but you are a person, and you are not the brand, right? Those are two different things. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about how, how that, uh, that worked in one particular example, and I'll directly answer your question as well. Uh, when I was um, invited to one of my first you know, top women in business awards, I remember walking out of the door, and my husband says, oh, congratulations, so proud of you. You know, and I looked back at him, and I said, you know, Dave, you know, you know, this is, it's Facebook that uh, uh, causes me to fall on that list. It's Facebook and the team that did this work, right? So, you know, it's okay. And he actually sat me down. He sat me down, and he said, no, listen, this is really important for us to talk about this. I agree that it's Facebook. I agree that it's the team. But you are the one playing the role of managing director of Facebook, and there is a reason why you are in that role, right? So, um, so while it is important to stay grounded. Let's also be sure that we celebrate our successes. Um, you know, keep the distinction, have everything in its own place. So that's story one. To your question of have things been uh, written, it's worked in uh, many different ways, right? I vividly remember this example where, uh, you know, something was written and someone who uh, I really respect a lot wrote an email to me and said, Kritika, go ahead, take credit for what you haven't done. It was someone whom I really respected. Now, how many of you likes receiving an email like that that says, you know, go ahead and take credit for what you want? Uh, in that particular example, we actually had an email transcript with a, with a journalist where we had clarified, you know, all of the attributions, et cetera, but of course they went and they write what they want to write. But that doesn't always happen, right? Uh, in this case, I was really grateful that one, the person, if he felt that way, actually told me about it, so I was able to address it with him. But I'm thinking to myself, there's another thousand, few thousand people reading this article who's going to think, yeah, Kirtika goes and takes credit for what she hasn't done. Um, at that point, it was really important that, uh, you know, my manager came by and said, listen, you know what you've done, you know you've acted with, you know, the complete right intent, you know the integrity that in, with which you operate, just keep going. You know, don't let this bother you. Don't let this break your spirit. Again, it's really, really important to, one, have that certainty about what you're do doing, why you're doing it, uh, and then also know that you are an individual representing a brand, but you are also you know, two distinct entities. You know, uh, just continue on the first part of the story of taking credit or not credit, you know, one of the things, uh, I don't know if it's, I can classify it as Indian women uh, thing or my thing. When I first joined Intel, like everybody would come and say, oh God, Lakshmi, you did such a great job. I'm like, oh no, no, I didn't do it. John did it, Susie did it, whatever, you know, because they feel, how can you take credit? So Barbara, who was my boss, stepped me aside. And in Intel, we have this ranking and rating, you know, where you're rated against your, your compatriots. He said, you make it so difficult for me to bat for you because any time I say, but look what Lakshmi did, they say, no, Lakshmi didn't do it, Susie did it, or John did it. She said, the one lesson I want you to remember is when someone gives you a compliment, just say thank you and shut up. <laughs> Nothing else. And it's been something that stayed with me for the last 20 years, you know, because we're very good at, oh, not me, not me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Varsha, talking about people, hiring people. Um, you know, when you were in Eve.com, you know, here you are both are young entrepreneurs, and I'm sure you had to hire people of all ages, experiences, etc. Do you d tell me a little bit about how was it to actually hire? Were there situations where you thought hmm, this is not the right person, or how do you build a team when you're so young, but everybody you need to work with probably is more experienced than you? So yeah, it was it was really really. Um incredible challenge and journey. I mean, the two of us, we were basically, I would say, highly unqualified to be entrepreneurs. We had come from consulting and banking and finished business school, and that's it. Uh, and we had an idea. Uh, and so we had to build, uh, all joking aside, we had core skills, let's say, and we had a great work ethic. Uh, but we didn't have industry experience in cosmetics. We were not technical. Uh, none of those things. And so one of the first pieces of advice 
we knew we needed uh, cosmetics expertise uh, because, of course, that was the industry we were going into. And uh, a friend of our, actually, Mar my partner, my co-founder's roommate, not her roommate, her, like, next-door neighbor, we met her, and uh, she said, you know, I know just the woman who has the expertise for you. And we got funding from an incubator and uh, Bill Gross at Idea Lab, and we set up this meeting with this woman who happened to live in Southern California. And we met her, and after the meeting, Bill came, and he, we, we sat down with Bill, and he's like, well, what do you think? And, and we, Miriam and I, were, we were talking, we, we looked at each other, and we're like, well, well, she's great. She's so nice. She's phenomenal, but she's really different from us. You know, she, In what way was she different from you? Well, she was, like, all over the place. Like, you know, we were, like, really, like, linear. You know, we were very organized, analytical. And she was, like, blah, 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 blah. I mean, she was also, at the time, she was probably, like, late 50s, like, incredibly warm spirit, boisterous. Like, um, and, and that was actually at the moment when Bill said to us, well, why do you need somebody else who's exactly like you? You need her because she brings all the contacts in the cosmetics industry. She is, you need her precisely for the reason that she's not like you. And it was a really great turning point for us to say, you're right. You know, her style is totally different. Her um, expertise is totally different. And that's actually why she's a really great compliment to us. And so we brought her on incredibly valuable to us. We have ended up becoming, like, you know, we became really close. She stayed with us the entire journey. She helped us bring in industry talent, um, senior merchandising talent, and other folks that we would never have actually had probably access to as well. And so it's just a small example of when you're building out your team, uh, you really need to think about what are your gaps as a leader and making sure you're open-minded enough to bring in the right talent to make sure you have a great rounded leadership team. That's the same advice my, husband, my dad gave me about my marriage. Why do you need to marry somebody the same? Marry somebody different. <laughs> so, because I had 20,000 reasons why I can't marry any man on this earth because <laughs> nobody is good enough. So, um, Varsha, just continuing on, you know, uh, Eve.com, there was a time when you both decided to sell the company, exit the company. And I'm sure things were still going great. You know, people were willing to give you money. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a, do you go IPO? Do you, you know, there's all these things an entrepreneur goes through. So tell me what was, take yourself back to that time and tell me what was going on in your mind that made you make that decision. So it was, uh, it was really a really crazy time and a, a wonderful time, I suppose. Uh, I guess, uh, first of all, we were always very passionate about what we were doing. And we wanted to continue to grow. We had grand visions for our business and our company. So I think it started off with that. We always saw capital as a means to enabling us to grow the business, not an end in and of itself. Uh, and so we had gone through a couple of rounds of fundraising, an incubator round, a Series A, a Series B. And we were in the process of starting to round, uh, raise a Series C. And at that time, we, we noticed a couple things. First of all, we, we were approached by all the banks to do an IPO. And so we, we sat in a few of these meetings. And truthfully, it was hard to imagine. We were like, wow, these people think we can go public. Like, that's kind of crazy. You know, like, <laughs> really? And so, but we listened. And, you know, uh, and yeah, we were listening. We were taking it all in. Uh, we were also actually in a fundraising round in a process. And... We were very close to uh, raising probably about $40 million. We'd already raised about $25 million. And it was at that time that we got an offer to be acquired uh, by a big luxury company, LVMH. And we, it, was a, it was a moment that caused us to pause. And, you know, we said, you know, we sense that the tides are changing a little bit. It had always been incredibly easy to raise money at that time. The, the, the Series B round we had, we actually, it was almost comical. We had our launch party, and uh, we had people who gave us term sheets at the party. And we were wearing dresses, and so we didn't even have any place to put them. So, you know, and, and, and by the time the Series C came around, we were, it was a lot more difficult to tell the story, the unit economics, you know, all of those things. And so we started to sense that the tides were changing, 
And we knew that uh, we weren't profitable yet. We needed capital to sustain the business. And so we thought, you know, maybe we should think about uh, these various options in, a, in a, very, a really serious way. And we also got great advice from our board. Uh, and I think I really credit our board with being really mature and saying, you know what, this is your first venture. Uh, this is a really solid offer that uh, this company has given you, and you should really think about accepting it. So it turns out that we ended up selling our business, uh, not to that company, but to uh, our, actually one of our investors who put another offer on the table. Uh, and we ended up having a successful uh, exit. But it was not an IPO, and I think it actually was for the best, uh, best interest of the business and for us, uh, just given the environment that subsequently happened. Yeah, and you stayed on, and ultimately it was the right decision because otherwise you would have had to let everyone go. And so I think sometimes, I mean, of course, in retrospect, every, every decision is great, but it's great that you made it at that time. I, th I would just say I do think that uh, a board is really, really valuable at that moment. It was our first experience. We really relied on advice from others. And to have a board that's really kind of measured and can give you great advice, uh, it's probably the most, one of the most critical times when your board uh, advice really matters. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm going to ask both of you about, we've been talking about the positive, uh, you, you know, the things you have to do out there as a leader, building your own brand, building the company brand, et cetera. But have there been situations also where it, affects you negatively, uh, you know, starting with you, Kritika, when you've already decided to move back to U.S. after being here for six years, and then the Free Basics happens, and the timing felt like you're going back because Free Basics didn't work, and you've been asked that also before. But you went through a certain decision process and said, hey, you know, life goes on. So tell us about what is it like when you know, things don't go as you planned, and how did you go through that decision? Did you think of maybe we should wait for another year or not, or tell me what you went through. Yeah. Um, so returning back was something that was honestly has been on our mind for about a year and a half. You know, that's when I first spoke to Facebook and said, you know, it looks like going back seems to be a matter of when, not if. Uh, and now with my two girls, going to high school and middle school this coming year. It was just a forcing function that we knew that we had to do it. So we had applied for schools. We had announced it all internally, so everyone internally knew. We were beginning to reach out to potential successors, and uh, that's when free basics happened, right? Uh, so we did debate about it. We said, okay, you know, what do we do? Um, on one, our decision was a decision, right? You, you just keep going ahead. You don't change decisions for uh, something like that. Uh, and two, as a company, we really pride ourselves on being transparent uh, and have being open in our communication. And we really wanted partners and clients to hear directly from us versus it somehow being leaked that, oh, we are interviewing for a successor um, um, you know, through external means. So, so I went ahead, I posted on Facebook. Uh, I think within hours, it made regional news, global news, all India newspapers. Um, and it was fascinating. Right? That weekend, I actually happened to be at a wedding in Chandigarh. Uh, so s moments like these have its highs and its lows. Uh, one of the hilarious moments were when they were picking up pictures from my Facebook profile. And uh, there was a picture that says, uh, someone who carried this article that says, the real reason Kirtika already quits. And they had a picture of me with, uh, uh, with my colleague's nani, right? I have no idea what the picture has to do with the title. But that was the picture. You should go look for it. It's a beautiful house. She has a gorgeous nani, the nani and me, and real reason why kids are ready. But, uh, but it was funny. Uh, and she wants uh, to get all happy in America, or uh, what was it? I have no <laughs> idea. There was like no correlation between the pictures of the wedding and you know, yeah. the real reason kids got quit. Uh, but uh, so we had a lot of fun about the coverage. Uh, uh, but. It, you know, it did have its moments too when people were calling you and, you know, friends and family were calling you and saying, what's going on? You know, have you quit? Um, and it was like, oh, God, you don't want your friends and your family to go through it. Mm -hmm. But then it lasted for 24 hours. And, and I forgot was, about you already. I, <laughs> I know, and I'm talking about how, our big, how we're making a big bet on mobile video. I'm going to talk to ET now in a, in a few yeah. hours about our bet yeah. on mobile video. Yeah. So life goes on, you know. Yeah. The two are different. And how about you, Varsha? Was there ever... Uh, as a time when you felt 
man, it can't go on or down. I mean, or has it always been a positive right for you? Well, I think every entrepreneur knows that being an entrepreneur is a roller coaster, right? I mean, there must be, I mean, I, I will say, I mean, I've been part of, I, I mean, I founded uh, Eve.com, and then I've been at Living Social and now at Airbnb, and they're all basically startups. Some are bigger and some are smaller, and I would tell you that it's a, it's an absolute roller coaster. So if you're in it, there must be something that's either crazy about you um, or you have somehow managed to uh, manage it because, uh, at least for me, uh, I always felt like, I had to be working for something, a mission or a, um, a vision that I found was found was so powerful and so compelling to take you through the low moments that you invariably will have. When you didn't get the sale or the client or things, the launches didn't happen the way you would like. Because I, I would say that not there, never, never is there a straight path to the top. I can remember so many times where you know, in the early days of Eve, no no cosmetic brand would come onto our platform. We, I, I mean, we, I would wake up at 6 a.m. because I was living in San Francisco uh, in my pajamas and literally spend the entire day calling uh, cosmetic companies to convince somebody to start to sell online. And nobody we would do it until we met two women who were the founders of Benefit Cosmetics. And somehow they thought you were smart and interesting and there might be something there. And they gave us the first contract. And they were exclusive to us. And it was, I think I remember, like January, you know, 1999. And, and that was the snowball or the, the thing that allowed them the next one and then the next one and then the next one. And so, you know, for all of the, if, if you're not persistent, you're probably not an entrepreneur. Uh, and I think those, but hopefully the highs are so high that it makes up for the low moments. Um, and you're doing something that you're truly passionate about that uh, otherwise, and that, that's what really keeps you going. And that's what's been for me. You know, uh, I mean, at least I find uh, as an entrepreneur, you have a very strong stomach. I mean, it's not at all glamorous and it's very very tough and because you can't show to the others what's going on but one of something happened in the last couple of days i want to share with you you know we build a platform we have a lot of stories and our whole thing is we say imagination to impact here are all these great people how can we connect them to others to make them successful but we are not an agency we are not this we are not that we know what we are not we keep saying, what are we, is what we are doing is even useful, you know, is it even worth it? So you go through these things. So three days ago, I got a mail from this girl who's a chess player. And, uh, you know, she lives in Rajmandri and uh, she somehow has participated in a lot of chess tournaments. And she's in the verge of, if she gets this last thing, she can qualify for a world tournament now. And she just doesn't have the money to fly to Greece. And she was very desperate. She applied to be an Inc. Fellow. And she literally has been writing to me every other day for the last month, you know. I need airfare, I need this, she needed about $3,000. But I'm like, how are we going to give it? Because we can't give it, she's not a current fellow, you know. So I just shot off three mails to three of our inner circle members. I said, look, here is his background, here is all the coverage, she needs the money, can anybody help? All three of them wrote back and said yes. And one of, the, and this is on Friday morning, she was literally like giving up hope on Friday morning. On Sunday morning, she was on a flight to Greece, and she went there, and she wrote back to us, and her competition is on 19th. And Lalita, she was, not only gave her this, he sent her a laptop so she can, like, practice chess online. And when she comes back, we're going to sit with her and connect her with a coach and really plan her next five years for her. So when something, all it needs is one thing to happen for you to say, okay, it's worth the, all the 50,000 crappy moments you have to go through on a, like a minute by minute basis, you know. So I always say that think of the one positive thing. And there's just, plenty uh, of negative ones. Add yeah. one thing. One of our core values at Airbnb is to be a serial entrepreneur, um, serial with a C. And I don't know how many of you guys know the story, but, um, you know, I think the, the founders of Airbnb, it seems like it's an overnight success. It's absolutely not. Um, you know, the founders started Airbnb because of a design conference. They needed money. 
uh, and then they had some people who came in and rent, were willing to rent air mattresses, that whole thing. But, and so they had a germ of a concept that they realized was something, but it really took them, uh, you know, they ended up going for three years without much traction at all, and, and that is a long time as an entrepreneur. Uh, yeah. And they had maxed out every single credit card. They had taken out like 40 credit cards. They had a, uh, you know, one of those binders with all the, the little places filled out. And they got so desperate that they, they basically, they, they were completely out of money. And there was the Democratic National Convention that came into town in, in Denver. And that year it had like moved at the last minute. And so actually there was a need for housing and, or people, places for people to stay. And at just around, so there were Airbnbs that were popping up around Denver, and just at the same time, they were both designed. Two out of the three were designers, and so they they designed these cereal boxes, uh, limited edition cereal boxes, one for Obama and one for McCain, who were the two candidates, and they sold them for forty dollars each on eBay, and they ended up selling a thousand boxes of um, the Obama O's, and. Not, I don't think they sold many of the McCain ones, but that was enough money, basically, to enable them to kind of carry out the business, uh, to take it to the next level. And then, truly, what ended up taking them to the next level is they applied for Y Combinator. And uh, they, that was kind of like their last-ditch last effort. They were still not getting the traction they wanted. And Paul Graham, actually, who's about to kind of reject their whole concept, but then Joe, who's one of the founders, pulled out a box of Obama O's, gave it to Paul, and he, Paul was like, well, what is this? Tell me the story behind this. And so they told him the story, and, and I, I think Paul Graham, the way I hear it is he said, well, look, these guys are crazy. They will do anything. <laughs> and if they, I'm not sure this idea around air mattresses is really the idea, but if they've come up with this crit level of creativity to survive, they're going to figure this out. And so they got into the program, and then that actually what is what ended up taking them to the next level, to the next level. So one of our core values is being a serial entrepreneur, uh, which I think we try to take to the business every single day, because the, often the problems uh, are not solved. There's no playbook, and you've got to figure it out every single day. And you need that kind of scrappy hunger uh, and persistence to stay at things in order to really win. That's great. You know, we have about nine minutes, so I'd like to take a couple of questions uh, from the audience, if there are any, before I ask you to give your advice to the entrepreneurs. Any questions? I know there will breaks, but Kritika was saying instead of just one way, it will be nice to have a dialogue. There's a question. Yeah, back the there. context for uh, the women entrepreneur over here, but I'm just curious myself if that's okay. Okay. Do you want to talk and then I'll talk? Um, hey, so um, I, I'm, just, I'm trying to reflect on the differences. You know, certainly uh, being at Facebook, uh, one has the fortune of being able to work with the very best people uh, in the industry. Uh, that's, uh, so that's a true joy. I will, I will say that um, uh, it is much harder uh, for us to, uh, you know, build a company with the same global values. And it was a big goal of ours as we wanted to build an organization with the same values as our global values. You know, we have very similar values around, uh, you know, move fast, uh, scrappy, hacker's way, you know, experiment a lot. We have a big value around being open. Uh, and really building organizations that are not hierarchical, where there's free flow of information, people challenge each other. Uh, and a lot of people told me when we started that, hey, Kirtika, you're not going to be able to build an organization like that given the cultural context. And of course, if someone tells you you're not going to be able to do it, you know, you're even more determined that you're going to do it. So we spent a lot of time in really internalizing what, is our, what do our values mean, having those dialogues, having those discussions, uh, and certainly, like from all of the metrics that we see, so for example, we have a process of open peer feedback. So during performance reviews, you have the option of giving performance feedback to your peers, to your managers directly. And if we gauge measures like that, 
we have been very, very successful at building an organization that is very different from 99.9% .9 of the companies out here in India, but it did take us a lot longer, and we have to continue to reinforce that time and again. Uh, you know, I'm a much smaller company than Facebook. So I find that in India, you know, I worked at Intel where it's like very aggressive culture, right? You know, if I didn't do something well, Andy Grove would like throw the thing at me and say, this is crap, you can do better, get out. I mean, you would have worked like 50 hours on it, right? But it's okay. To here, and in between I worked in a nonprofit, and I think that really prepared me. India is a very emotional country. You know, and people who come to work for me, I find is very emotional. You just can't say, hey, this is, this is not good enough. You have to explain what it is. You have to say why it didn't work. May, can we work together so that it can, while you're going inside, like, you know, <laughs> you just have to learn to just be, it's like managing a teenager versus talking to another 40-year-old or something like that. And also, we talk about balance, work, and home. In India, to me, it's all one thing. You know, you cannot separate. Because, yes, you do have a grandfather who slipped and fell, and you have to take him to the hospital, and you also have to deliver this report, and which means now I have to send somebody on a bicycle to the hospital to pick up the report from you because the Internet at home didn't work to upload it. I mean... It just is a fact of life. So one thing is I know why meditation generated in India. <laughs> because <laughs> that is the only way, breathe, <laughs> you can operate uh, here. So it's, uh, I mean, in, in, in America, it, I only worked at Intel. I didn't work anywhere else. I worked at Intel and at a nonprofit. That's it, my 20 five years are in only those two places. It's very logical. You know, I can argue with Andy if I wanted, if I didn't agree on something. It's very logical. It's very, uh, nobody takes it personally, even if I call them names. It's about the product. In that name, I could say a lot of things, but mm -hmm. the point is it's about the product. It's about getting somewhere. And, you know, but here, it's everything is mixed in a lot. And I find in general, um, the capacity of people to manage is at a very junior level here, you know, I mean, in the sense, and it's just evolution of industry. I mean, India is to me a 25 year old country because it opened up in only 91, if I get my math right. And uh, whereas a lot of industrial economies are 200, 150, 100 years old. So it's just a matter of time. But the amount of training you need to do to your team here whether it's even writing emails or talking to people, even very basic things is a lot, lot more. But at the same time, the level of passion, commitment, loyalty is also quite unbelievable. So it's a, it is a 13-year-old versus a 30-year-old. I mean, that's just the way I feel. Yes. Yeah. They are young. <laughs> Being young, is it good? I mean, if the question is, will they hire me versus you? <laughs> so I, um, I have a really great hair lady. Uh, so that's why, um, and probably some decent genetics. Uh, it's a really interesting question. I am not sure it's good for you. To be young? Uh, to look young. To look young. Uh, you know, but what can you do, right? So you just got to, I mean, I'm happy I look young. Uh, but back then when I was an entrepreneur, we were young, and I really was young. And so then it was kind of like, well, you're really young. Should we give you funding, and can you do this? And now when I'm older and I, I still look young, it's kind of like, how, how, why does she think she has can have these strong points of view and all these experience when she's like the same, you know, she's 30 or 32 and not 46? And, um, you know, it is what it is, but I'm still happy. I feel young. And... Uh, so what can you do? I embrace it, and uh, you, you just have to be who you are, and you're lucky. Kirtika's secret is Pilates. Anyway, <laughs> what's your uh, answer to that, Kirtika? Um, oh, you know, secret, you're looking young, right? So number one, uh, 
genetics. <laughs> genetics. Great problem. hair lady. Hair lady. <laughs> uh, to, uh, you know, really working on something that you love. You know, I, I think that's a common theme that came up across the board. You know, life is too hard. It has its ups and downs, and you really have to believe passionately about what you do. Um, again, very fortunate to work for a very mission-driven company. You know, making the world more open and connected is what drives every one of us, keeps us going. Um, two children, again, 13 years and uh, 10 years old, uh, and they keep you on your toes. And yes. making sure you have the time for exercise and nutrition, again, really important. Can be done, doesn't take more time. It actually gives you more energy, gives you more time in the day. So make sure you prioritize that. Great. So parting words from both of you. Um, so one, dream big. Uh, two, you know, as much as each of you in the audience are seeking role models like each one of us do, know that you are a role model yourself for many others. So know that role. Uh, mentor, coach, sponsor. Remember, there's a difference between sponsoring someone and coaching, and we need more of the sponsors. I think there's enough mentors. Uh, and lastly, be sure to enjoy the journey uh, as much as uh, you enjoy the destination. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, being an entrepreneur, I think, takes tremendous courage. So congratulations for even taking the step. Uh, I think hopefully you will find that it is the, one of the most rewarding uh, journeys that you will be on. And regardless of what happens, the entrepreneurial skills that you learn is incredibly valuable. Being an, having entrepreneurial DNA is so rare, even at large companies, that I, what you're building now will be useful for you wherever you go. So I think congratulations on even taking the step. Uh, the second thing I would say is definitely do something you're passionate for. Uh, because it is a tough journey, and so that is what will hopefully um, take you through the highs and lows, uh, and have fun, and realize that all of the things that you know were discussed in the first panel around um, diversity and leadership and core values and culture, you have the ability to shape that for a whole uh, workforce and a whole generation of other women, and so take that opportunity and make sure that you define success for your organization, not just on the revenues and the metrics, but also how you get there, because that's also something that you can uniquely shape. So I have to wrap up on, I started with a story, I have to wrap up on a story of a guy who's called in to fix a boat. You know, they've been trying to fix the boat for like 10 days, they can't fix it. The guy comes with a little hammer, and then he goes in, like taps somewhere, and then takes the hammer, does something, and the boat starts. Two minutes work. So his bill comes next day and it says $10,000. And the management freaks out. Like the guy was here for two minutes. Why is it $10,000? So the guy sends the, he said, can you explain your bill? He explains the bill. He writes it to say, to tap, $1. To know where to tap, $9,999. So the reason I want to wrap up is that one of, as entrepreneurs, one of the things is know your worth and ask for it. And I think that's one of the things a lot of us are hesitant to do. But know what $9,999 worth is. Have a great time. Thank you.